Welcome to the National Museum of the American Indians webinar series, Youth in Action, Conversations About Our Future. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Bullard, a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina and the Reservations Coordinator at the National Museum of the American Indian. Youth in Action is a monthly webinar series featuring young Native activists and change makers from across the Western Hemisphere who are working toward equity and social justice for Indigenous peoples. As we begin today's program, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. Today's program asks the question, how does identity influence activism? Many tribal nations have always recognized multiple genders and those who possess both male and female spirits. Native people who identify as more than one gender or possessing both spirits sometimes refer to themselves as two-spirit. A prominent historical figure who embodied multiple gender roles in the Zuni community was Wiwa. Wiwa also served as a cultural ambassador and negotiator who traveled to Washington, D.C. in the late 1800s. In celebration of Pride Month, today's program features Indigenous youth working in the fields of education, health, cultural heritage, and the arts to amplify Two-Spirit and Native LGBTQ plus voices and issues. Please welcome our panelists, Ryan Young, Stuk Savannah Kiavorabuth, and Naomi Menendez Romero. Let's start by having each of you introduce yourself. Let's start with Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Young. I'm a uh, Lactofamba Ojibwe from the Lactofamba Reservation in Northern Wisconsin. Um, I live out in New Mexico right now uh, and identify as Two-Spirit and I use they, them pronouns. Naomi? Hola, que tal a todos, a todos y a todes. Mi nombre es Naomi Mendez Romero. Soy de Juchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca y me identifico como Mu. And Suksuban. Hello, everyone. My name is Suksavan Kiavorbuth. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Diné or Navajo Nation, and I'm also second generation Laotian. I'm super, super excited to be here with everyone. Um, I'm also a second year PhD student at Oregon State University. Thank you, panelists, for introducing yourself. So our first question, how does your identity influence your activism? So Savan, would you like to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, so for me, I think um, my identities have completely shaped the way I like go about the world. Um, I identify as Nadle or Two-Spirit. Um, Nadle is the Navajo word for um, Two-Spirit, essentially um, loosely, translated to, to English. Um, I think it embodies this idea of energies and something that um, was mentioned in the description of two spirit is this idea of two spirits, right? And I think within Nadle, it allows this en encompassing um, idea of masculine and feminine energies. And we have this concept um, and pathway of life in Dene called Hajon, which means the beauty way. And essentially um, it was like created and formed around Nadle people because there's this balance of masculine and feminine energies, right? And so um, if you can have this balance, you can get to the beauty way. And so that's why before um, Nadle people were super, super respected and um, highly looked upon because of this pathway of life. And that has really shaped and molded the way that I navigate the world and navigate spaces. So I try to bring that into all the spaces I'm in, whether that is academia or in the community or just hanging out with people. And so that's how it's kind of shaped my life. Thank you, Sixtavon. I definitely agree with you with defining the masculine and feminine, feminine characteristics. Ryan, would you, would you like to go next? Oh, yeah. Um, so identity is kind of like a theme that is in a lot of the artwork that I make. Um, a lot of the photography and stuff that I do is really focusing on representation and kind of showing how diverse 
our two spirit community is. Um, and it, I think it was mainly kind of inspired because I uh, didn't really have a lot of representation that I saw growing up. Um, and so a lot of the work I really wanted to focus on kind of just showing how diverse everything was. Um, and then too, just kind of looking at the different ways that identity works um, because we, you know, we grow up and we, we learn who we are and we kind of learn our place within our community, but then um, our life is kind of going through the ways that other people choose to identify us or the other, the, the ways that other people recognize us. Um, and that happens with artists too, you know, that happens with our work. Um, you know, Norval Morisau is a, a queer indigenous uh, painter and a lot of his work um, was uh, like very like native looking in appearance. And so um, that was kind of how his work was identified, but he was also openly bisexual. Um, but a lot of the work that he did around like erotic art or um, the different themes that he did when he talked about sexuality, it wasn't really, um, wasn't really a part of that conversation. And so when I was starting out as um, in my own career, I really wanted to make art that um, you couldn't um, say it was one thing or the other. Like you couldn't say it was just native art or that it was just queer art. Um, I wanted to work with themes that maintain those relationships uh, with sexuality and gender and our cultures um, and making sure that those conversations uh, always talked about those themes together because that's, you know, that that's how I navigate the world as a two-spirit person. You know, there's not one experience where I'm just having, where I'm just native or I'm just queer. Like it's always the, those things coexisting that um, build my perceptions of the world. And Naomi, how has your identity influenced your activism? Bueno, en mi activismo, quiero empezar con, con el lema de Muse, Muse en el vocabulario de Yasa, en la Casa de la Cultura de Cuchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca, Muse significa feminado y significa miedo. Eh, la comunidad Muse rompe el miedo para tener una propia identidad sexogenérica, como Muse Guna, que es Muse mujer, o Muse Ingyu que es mucho hombre, pero al final de cuentas la palabra timuse se está hablando de la persona si es él o la muse, ¿no? Y en esa identidad nosotras nos sentimos con una fuerza masculina pero con una sensibilidad femenina y esas nos hacen ser la persona que hoy en día somos como muses. Muchas gracias. Great. Great, Fanless, and thanks for sharing. Now that we've established how your identity has influenced your activism, I have specific questions for each of you. Ryan, your art has brought voice and visibility to queer indigenous people. Tell us more about your work and how it fosters community cohesion. Uh, so a lot of the artwork that I make um, is really kind of focused on like the historical aspects around two-spirit identity um, or looking at language, um, kind of trying to reintroduce those discussions as part of like the, when we have conversations around traditions, you know, that there's never really a talk about the ways that our communities uh, recognize different genders and sexualities. And so um, I wanted to initially kind of create work that rebuilt that relationship or it showed folks existing um, with those identities because those conversations or talking about this kind of stuff um, wasn't really happening in my own community um, growing up. And I really wanted to, um, I guess just reconnect with that. And uh, so the work that I was making really kind of focused on um, the ways that we identified ourselves or um, how our different communities identified us um, because there's so, many different terminologies, like even in the queer community, like different ways that we identify ourselves, um, but they don't really um, incorporate the, the community aspect or the, the ways that um, our own traditional languages uh, would recognize us in our community. Um, <clears throat> and so the artwork that I started out making um, kind of just show like the ways that we're existing kind of in this um, contemporary, world, you know, that we're, you know, even when I learned about the word two-spirit, you know, I had to um, 
go to college before I even learned about those terms. And, you know, so the, the conversations that were happening around um, the understanding of gender and sexuality within my own tribal identity, you know, that that's a kind of a privileged space to be able to have that in a college because we don't really have those conversations on the reservation. <clears throat> um, and so the work that I made kind of wanted to go beyond um, just like a two-spirit 101 because there is so much information out there but a lot of the the focus is towards like very introductory or basic level um kind of understanding or workshops and so the work that I put together kind of starts thinking about like well how do we re-establish like our space within the community or how do we um you know make sure that we have access to our cultures when there are some times where we experience folks that might be in those positions you know and they might have, um, you know, they might behave in a way that's homophobic or transphobic or where it makes us uncomfortable to be in that space, but how do we still get access to that information? Um, and so I think with the, like the Two-Spirit project that I put together, which was a kind of a photo project where folks were able to um, submit their own photos or I did a photo shoot with them. Um, and then they were also able to I had like a statement or like a something that was affirming like why they identified the way that they do or why they felt confident being a two-spirit person. Um, and so I think just by getting the the visual part out there, making sure that, you know, we were representing ourselves or that we were um, able to kind of build our own narratives. I think that was the first step to uh, rebuilding that community. Great, and my next question is for Naomi. Naomi, you, know, you currently work for the Taney Valencia Alliance. Can you tell us more about the organization and your work there? Bueno, claro que sí. Bueno, la asociación se llama Tana, Tani Valenzo, que es una organización que trae, que trae Tania Gómez Palomino. El programa es Programa de Vivienda Emergente, que estamos trabajando exactamente con el coordinador nacional del Programa de Vivienda Emergente, que es Ariel Viñedos. Este programa lo que traemos es construcción de viviendas a nivel estatal. Ahorita estamos en el estado de Oaxaca y aquí estamos apoyando a mucha gente en sus construcciones de viviendas, ya de que a partir del 2017, 2018 hubo un terremoto en nuestra región y hoy en día estamos retomando esta parte de apoyar a, a la gente y sobre todo también que, que vuelva la reactivación económica en nuestra región. Lamentablemente con el COVID-19, pues, han pasado y, y hemos estado un poquito eh, pasando malos momentos. Por ejemplo, en estos tiempos, eh, hoy en día, el día de ayer, toda esta semana estuvo lloviendo y pues hoy, últimamente en, este, en nuestra región ahorita empiezan las inundaciones. Eh, ahorita lo que estamos haciendo, pues estamos viendo en cómo seguir apoyando a nuestra gente y sobre todo, pues apoyar al pueblo general de Cuchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca. And Suxavan, one of your research areas is the two-spirit identity in urban areas. Could you tell us more about your research and what you've learned? Um, so my research kind of started with, um, based off like my identities and a little bit about me before I kind of jump into the research because they're all kind of super interconnected and that's what's really powerful about research too is like, the connectedness between people and the work, right? I think we think about academia where it's just the work and then you just do that and you're separated when I like to think that, and I think it's powerful that we have Naomi and Ryan here too because their whole like body and essence is in their work too. And so um, I'm super honored to be here with the two of them as well learning, right? And, and so I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I'm originally from the Navajo Nation and I would go back pretty often and um, most of my breaks to really like enjoy home and be home and be connected to the land. And, um, and so after a while, I was actually super like envious of, of like native people living on the res, right? And so like my home nation and because I was living in a city and I felt disconnected and over time, right? Learning about what my family went through and like the 
programs they went through and relocation and policy that like impacted their livelihood really shaped my way of looking at things now. And so um, I think thinking about the ways that Native identity is portrayed in the U.S. as like you have to be reservation or urban and it creates this dichotomy that's like, well, then if you're urban, then you're not as native, right? And I think that's very toxic because there's policy that literally forced native people to live in cities. And um, my family was um, a part of the Indian placement program, which was um, heavily impacted the Navajo nation that forced native children to move to Utah and convert to Mormonism. And, and then there's the relocation program that uh, my family also experienced when my grandpa went to Chicago. Um, and eventually like this whole thing happened with my mom of like, there's so much going on where I was like displaced, right? I was displaced and now I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like I'm Navajo anymore because I was shipped off, you know, and so there's trauma in in storytelling behind that experience that has shaped mine. Right. And so I grew up in Phoenix and and now I am very like proud of urban identity because it's a part of my story, part of my history and a part of my legacy. Right. And and so I think that my connectedness between that and my work is is really powerful. And and so I'm going to jump off of what Ryan was talking about. I didn't really know about two-spiritness until I entered college as well. And I think that is something that we don't really talk about in our communities or in Diné Bazaar or Diné um, is like Nadle. And so um, it really connected to me. And as I was like coming out as well, like what does it mean to like be queer and native and and I remember laying in bed one time when I was young, like Native people are queer, you know? And like, that's what I learned from Western movies or the ways that we begin to understand um, like Native people within Western films or Western society, or even acknowledging that we exist, right? And so I had this idea that like, I can't. And, and it's a tactic that's been used to like allow our community to not be queer in those ways when we are we are queer and so um with all of that said I, so i jumped into um undergrad and i got a, a dual bachelor's in sustainable um, urban planning and american indian studies and where i was looking at the ways that cities are structured and then i jumped into the master's program where i was actually doing both again so i was doing a, a dual master's in urban planning and american indian studies And then when I graduated, it was in 2017, and that was the turn of administration. And as uh, a two-spirit person, a queer person, a brown person, right? And I'm sure other panelists and um, our moderator might have felt this too. Like we, it felt like my identity was under attack. I didn't feel safe in this country with that new administration. Um, And that's just um, a reality that we live, right? And so I was like, I. I don't know what to do and I know that I should give back to my two-spirit community because I feel disconnected. I feel unsafe and so what can I do to help? Um, And so a lot of my work in my master's program was around um, mental health, about um, mental health um, and in two-spirit communities and how intergenerational trauma connects with mental health in a lot of ways. And now that I finished my master's and I'm in a PhD program. I really miss um, urban life. And um, I go to Oregon State University, which is in Corvallis, a very small town. And I was coming from Phoenix. (laughs) Um, And I was like, I really miss the city and I miss the ways that cities are structured. And so I'm actually forming those back together. My research, my dissertation is on um, looking at urban planning as a settler colonial tool that has continuously portrayed and um, intentionally, unintentionally um, harm onto indigenous people through gender, racial and sexual violence. And we can see that through history um, with the ways that cities are structured and designed. 
Um, and so that's just a little bit about my research. I know it was a long journey, but um, I think it was important to tell how it all connected and came to be because it's kind of complex. Yeah, so thank you. thank you all for sharing your amazing efficacy work in your communities. Now let's talk a little bit more about some of the challenges you have faced. Let's start with Naomi. Naomi, what is one challenge that you've encountered in your work? What change still needs to be made? Bueno, ¿qué cambio? Primero quiero hablar en esta parte, ¿qué cambios hemos logrado? Ahorita en el estado de Oaxaca ya está el cambio de identidad. Eh, las bodas igualitarias en el estado de Oaxaca igual ya fueron legalizadas, gracias a Dios. Y un desafío para mí o un legado que me gustaría dejar es abrir una casa hogar para la comunidad mushe, porque al final de cuentas las mushe son las únicas que se quedan con los padres, pero cuando fallecen los padres, ¿quién se quedan con las mushe? Para mí ese es un desafío muy importante en mi vida personal, porque me gustaría abrir una casa hogar exclusivamente para la diversidad sexual, o en este caso para las compañeras y compañeros mushe de nuestra región, y sobre todo eh, seguir reactivando la economía en, en nuestro país, y sobre todo aquí en Cuchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Naomi. And Ryan, what are your, some of your challenges? And what changes needs to be made? Um, I would say probably one of the biggest challenges I faced was trying to figure out how to bring these conversations into our communities. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, let me think when I, there was a year when I worked for tribal AmeriCorps, um, when I was working on my reservation and, um, when I was working with like my youth council, we were trying to think of like the different things that we thought that we needed for like the high school. Um, and I know that there was a time when we attempted to try to put together like a student, like a LGBTQ plus student group. Um, and there was just a lot of, it was like initially well received and it kind of started out okay. And then um, immediately it got like, uh, there's a lot of conflict and like a lot of people that are uncomfortable with those conversations. And so like we couldn't even, promote the that we ha even had that group it had to be something that was like strictly word of mouth like there wasn't an opportunity for we, us to make flyers or to try to help and recruit and try to see if there was any folks that could benefit from the student organization uh, and that you know and that was a experience that even happened when I myself was in high school after coming out um, I was dealing with a lot of backlash in regards of like it was easier to not talk about it than to um, support those events. Uh, and so when I um, started at the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, back in 2014, uh, we, when we got kind of familiar with how student groups were put together, uh, some friends and I organized uh, Indigenous Queers Plus. And so this student organization really focused on looking at the historical aspects around two-spirit identity, um, trying to look at policies and stuff that were in the school that might have been outdated that we could help update or and you know and we ended up doing like a lot of really cool things you know we um, helped collaborate and create a, a gender neutral housing floor I think we um, added pronouns and different gender identities to like the application to apply um, we had our first uh Pride Week that was funded through the American Indian College Fund. You know, so it was really cool because a lot of the the things that we wanted to change that we brought to the administration, they were really receptive. Um, you know, and it was uh, really cool to kind of get that support from you know the Native art community because you know that that wasn't a experience that we a lot of us might have had. Um, and so trying to figure out you know how do we bring that into our smaller communities or how do we get that kind of access for folks, you know, cause not everyone goes to college or, you know, not everyone's gonna go to IA where, you know, there's one of few groups is there that functions like this. Um, and so it just, it kind of came down to thinking of different ways to make resources accessible. Um, so with the Western State Center, I was able to collaborate with some uh, other amazing other uh, queer native activists um, and we put together the Indigenizing Love Toolkit. And so um, I think like the first part of the toolkit talks about the different historical aspects. There's terminology in there. Um, 
we talk about different folks in history. I think we talked about, um, you know, even the the reservations that exist today that legalize gay marriage, you know, and so kind of looking at the, the different ways that our tribal communities have supported two-spirit people. Um, and then the second part of the toolkit is focused on um, how do you start those conversations within student organizations or how do you start those conversations um, with like tribal community, like tribal government. Um, and so it, it talked about like, how do you establish a space to talk about two-spirit identity or how do you, um, like just different activities. And then um, we added a bunch of different resources in the toolkit. So, you know, there's different artists, there's scholars, there's different books that you can read. There's movies that talk about queer indigenous identity. You know, we really wanted to create something that was um, accessible, but then, you know, provided more resources or, you know, like it, it gave um, enough information that you would want to learn more, um, you know, and I, we were really thinking of uh, the younger queer native folks in the community that, you know, might not have, um, you know, like I didn't have library books that talked about queer identity in my high school or, you know, there was never a class that had those conversations. And um, so a lot of the, the learning that I had to do was self-initiated. Um, and so now we have this toolkit, which is free and accessible online. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're just kind of continuing to, to work with different initiatives and different um, youth orgs to kind of think about how do we continue to not only get this information into our, uh, our smaller communities, but how do we um, start to have that conversation? Like, how does it evolve? You know, because we can't just do two spirit 101 conversations forever. We have to start thinking about, you know, why, you know, now that we're talking about different historical figures that are two spirit, um, you know, like, you know, the terminology, even with that, you know, they didn't identify as two spirit. Two spirits a super contemporary term. You know, there's actual language that our historical ancestors used, you know, and how do we start talking about the actual ways that their identity played a role with how they contributed to their community. Um, and, you know, and starting to do that, or how do we start to actually change policies within um, our reservations to allow, um, you know, just, I guess, just more equality for two-spirit and queer people, you know, like, there's so many different aspects of our lives that um, are affected by people not wanting to learn this information and not supporting um, queer people, you know, like, there's issues with, like, adoption and housing and stuff that are all, they all play a role into how we build our community, and so I think just continuing to create more resources, I think, help overcome my feeling of there not really being any when I was growing up. Thanks, Ryan. And Suk Savan, what has been your one challenge and what change needs to be made? Yeah, um, for me, I I was thinking of a lot in my head that I, I've, I've experienced. Um, but one that really stuck out to me was I'm in the I'm in the process right now of of like publishing articles or poems or um, pieces right for publication. And I think one of the biggest things that I've received from like um, reviewers is like the, a really big critique on indigeneity. And it's like, how can you critique my indigeneity when like, maybe I don't know what they identify as, but it's always very critical, right? And, and in the terms of like very academic, it has to be an academic article. And I, I understand that there are um, like academics uh, articles, but at the same time, it creates this like gatekeeping of knowledge, right? And I think that is something that I've ran across, um, especially being in a PhD program, it's been very much so it has to be structured this way you have to use this these type of language but my big thing and I'm this is the change that I'm trying to do in my work and something that I kind of like push back in my in my writing too is like accessibility I want my community to have access to it I want folks to have access I want people in this on the panel I want people in um, who's attending this session to have access to my work and I mean access as in like I don't want to use language that's like trying to please white academia because I don't think that's going to get 
our community anyway, right? I think it needs to be at a, a, a level where like, I try to write where I'm having conversations with people. And so that's the approach that I try to do in terms of accessibility, but also like using different types of mediums. So I use poems or try to like dip into other stuff of like writing, um, play with my writing style. So I, I just like did a, um, did one recently that was published like in April, I believe. Um, that was like a creation story and then a personal narrative and then another creation story. So it was really, it was really fun to do. And I, I try to do those um, because I've had a lot of friends who are like, how did, how do you, how do you do it? You know, how do you go, how do you understand all of the articles that you have assigned to you? I don't, <laughs> you know, like I, it, and that's the, that's the truth. Like it's, it's hard because sometimes these papers aren't written for us, right? And they're not meant for us to read because they want us to feel like we're outside when we belong inside too. Um, and so I'm trying to do that work in um, allowing other folks to do that work too and encourage people. Um, I teach um, I teach as well and I taught two terms um, of men and masculinity. And then this recent one, which was super fun, it was called Disney Gender, Race and Empire. And so they analyzed Disney films. And so um, I really pushed their writing to be like inclusive and they don't have to use big words to get their point across. They can like imagine them having a conversation with me and that's writing, right? And that's the beauty of it because it's so, it can be magical when you're just enjoying it. Um, but that's some of the stuff that I'm wanting to change within academia. It's going to be a lot of work, but something that I'm hoping to achieve. Great, Palace. Thanks for sharing. So moving forward and looking at the future of our communities and the LGBTQ plus two-spirit Musha communities, um, what are some ways allies can be supportive? Like, what do you think our allies could do? to be supportive of our communities. Um, Suk Savan, would you like to go? Yes, um, I think that um, a lot of, um, for like allyship, and I think there's, um, as like Ryan and Naomi were uh, mentioning, there's so much complexity with it. And so with Two-Spirit Identity, so I'm like queerness and indigeneity are so, intertwined right and so uh depending on like allyship and I'll, I'll, i guess i'll speak from like a well like an outside perspective i think understanding the capacity of two-spirit energy so like you know like i asking two-spirit folks to always educate you on two-spiritness can get tiring at times right or like asking indigenous people to always um um do a land acknowledgement or something like that, right? It, it gets tiring after a while. And so I think we have um, like Google. And so I think like looking and finding resources, um, it can be difficult at times, right? And I think that allows a gateway into, into that. So you're not putting all of the effort or work onto two spirit folks. And so I think that is one way that um, you can be an ally for two-spirit people um, is like baby see what our energy level is at, at that day um, because I know that right Naomi and Ryan and all of us in this panel Anthony and I like do um, work a lot of work and so we would love to continue to like educate and 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 produce this work um, and so it's like a, a given give and take in, in some ways, right? And so um, just be mindful and, and respectful of like our energies as people too. Thanks, thanks, Savan. And Naomi, what are your thoughts on how our allies can be supportive of us? Bueno, yo creo, porque pues, la, bueno, la verdad, de, de, desde mi perspectiva, voy a, voy a hablar. Eh, cuando pasó exactamente el terremoto, en el 2017 hicimos una red a nivel nacional en todo México y hasta ahorita es una red trans 
en este caso soy la única mushe eh, representando la región del estado de Oaxaca, y, y sí hubo mucho apoyo, no les voy a engañar, sí hubo mucho apoyo, hasta hoy en día sigo en contacto con todas ellas, y estoy agradecida con cada una de ellas, con las asociaciones civiles, con personas eh, políticas también que nos han apoyado en diferentes ámbitos, y sobre todo... Eh, lo que es el apoyo para, para la gente en general, no nada más para la diversidad sexual, sino es para el pueblo de, de Juchitán de Zaragoza, Oaxaca. Y me he dado a conocer por la tarea de ser activista, por luchar por los derechos de la diversidad sexual y sobre todo también por apoyar a mi gente, que es algo que hasta hoy en día lo seguimos haciendo y lo seguiré haciendo hasta el último día de mi, de mi vida. ¿no? Entonces, hasta ahí yo creo de que me siento alegre, me siento contenta y me siento feliz de que la red ahorita ya no es nada más nacional, sino ahorita también ya tenemos red a nivel internacional, donde hay gente que nos siguen apoyando y nos siguen, y se siguen sumando a ese proyecto de apoyar a toda la gente de nuestra región. Entonces, para mí sí es un orgullo y un gusto de, de estar con ustedes y compartirle mi experiencia y también demostrándoles de que todas y todos unidas siempre podemos hacer muchas cosas buenas. Muchas gracias. Thanks, Naomi. And Ryan, what are your thoughts on how our allies can be supportive? Um, I guess I would say to, to really understand the meaning of the word ally, too, that it's not something that you self-identify as. It's something that the community that you're supporting gives to you. Um, and by doing that, you know, respecting space. Um, there's, I remember reading this book called Becoming Two-Spirit. I can't remember who wrote it, um, but it was this non-Native guy that was at um, like a two-spirit ceremony and that there was a part where they had all gone into like a separate room and he um, got mad because he couldn't go in there for that part of the ceremony and so he felt entitled to that space because he's like well I'm writing this book about you all like I should deserve to do this and there's this um, con like belief that like all cult like like or what is it called like and folks are just saying like culture is meant to be shared or it's meant to be this and it's like you know you can learn this stuff but there needs to be some kind of reciprocation you know like if you want to learn about two-spirit identity and you don't know how to do that bring in a two-spirit person to do that work but pay them you know or make sure that that you're you're giving back to the community that you're trying to get that information from and then to understand that you're not going to have access to all that information um you know and that's you know, I think a lot of like even not even just two spirit people, but like native and indigenous folks in general, um, when we're in academic spaces, you know, there's a lot of expectations that we have the time to go in and just talk and talk about history and to do all this work for free or, you know, or like we don't have homework or we don't have exams or a degree that we're trying to get as well. You know, that if you're going to um, ask for our information, or ask for our history, you know, you need to be willing to put in that work to learn that or listen to us and to make sure that you're supporting that community from then on. And then uh, I guess just making sure that we're not being tokenized for an event, you know, that if you're gonna bring native people into a queer space, that there's some discussion afterwards on how do you continue to support native people beyond that moment or how do you continue to create space for two-spirit and queer indigenous folks beyond just that one event that you needed us at. Thank you, Ryan. So thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Now we would like to open it up to questions from our live audience. Our first question from our audience is, is the term two-spirit exclusive, exclusive to indigenous community? Um, Naomi, would you like to answer that? Me puedes volver a repetir la pregunta? Is the term two-spirit exclusive to the indigenous community? Bueno, para mí, eh, dos espíritus, y lo, lo dije desde hace ratito y lo vuelvo a repetir, para mí es una esencia masculina y una sensibilidad femenina que nos hace ser tal cual una dualidad, ¿no? Tanto como ella como él. En nuestra región así se maneja con la palabra eh, en el vocabulario de Yatá, que es el vocabulario zapoteco, es la palabra timuche, porque la palabra timuche significa él o la muche, ¿no? 
y nos identificamos con esta dualidad y nos hace ser parte de nuestra cultura y sobre todo nuestra región. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Naomi. <clears throat> I think we have time for one more question. Oh, um, could I could I answer on that one too? Actually, sure. Um, as I would just say too, like, um, two spirit, I think is or like already gets appropriated by non-native folks as like a, a gender identity or a sexuality, and there's this understanding that it, it transcends all of that. You know that there is. Um, a community aspect and you know a historical aspect that ties you know all those things into um, the community recognizing us and you know and like even two spirits not I think the, the English word two spirit isn't even used by all um, communities that may recognize multiple genders you know that there's their own terminology and their own um, ways that those words are defined that are unique to that specific community that um, I think only reiterates why it like that's where it should stay you know that it's it's a identity that connects everything about you know like queerness and you know even gender identity and two-spirit identity and um you know because not everybody who's two-spirit is queer and you know not everybody um who is trans is two-spirit you know like it, it it encompasses so much more than i guess the western language can uh define it as Thanks for that, can I Ryan. Also, sure. Can I also, thank you. Uh, just to jump off of Ryan and and Naomi, so this is kind of like the um, some of the research I've done as well, um, and kind of like conversations I've been having with a queer community, two spirit community. Um, is it was this question is um, understanding how like the construction of two spirit kind of functions, right? And so as we know in the U.S. Um, uh, race, gender, sex, and sexuality are all socially constructed, right? And so two-spirit kind of, as Ryan's saying, it's so complex because those are fixed when two-spirit lives outside of this fixed notion of race, gender, sex, and sexuality. Um, and so with those constructs, you have LGBTQ based off of these fixed ideas of identity. And so um, and not to speak for anyone in the room, but I think like, right, Two-Spirit lives outside of this fixed space. And that is the magic of, of the term Two-Spirit and allows people to like embrace it how they want. And at the same time, recognizes the attachment to indigeneity because it existed before the fixed notions of race, gender, sex, and sexuality. Thank you, Suk Savan. And I know we're running out of time and then we have a lot more we would like to discuss, but we must come to a close. And I would like to thank our panelists for being here and sharing your perspectives. You can learn more about our panelists work by checking them out on social media. Thank you to everyone that has worked on our youth in action series, our panelists, and those that came before us to make this possible. The youth in action series will return in September, 2021 and information about our upcoming episodes will be posted on our website in the coming weeks. To explore other ways you can enjoy the National Museum of the American Indian from home, visit us at AmericanIndian.si.edu. Thank you for joining us and we will see you at our next Youth in Action program. <laughs>